Well, that's a great beginning. Hi. <laughs> Hello, welcome. I am Petra Wright. I am the gallery director of Gloria Delson Contemporary Arts, also known as GDCA Gallery. And um, Happy New Year. We would like to welcome you to our inaugural 2021 virtual reception, celebrating our two beautiful exhibits, Fragments and Cheryl Rutka, Stan Johnson, where we were. Um, both exhibits are on display through January 31st, and they are available for in-person viewing by masked appointment, and social distancing is, of course, enforced. All of the works are for sale, so if you see anything that grabs your interest, please don't be shy, contact us, and if you would like immediate reference, you can go to our website, which is www.gdcagallery.com. Under current exhibit, you there is an exhibition catalog. If you scroll right to left, so if you're moving in that direction, past the installation stills, you will get to an exhibition catalog by artist and every single artwork is listed with dimensions, title, medium, and price. So, this is the final month of our three month engagement of Cheryl Retka, Stan Johnson, where we were. I'm gonna be emotional. <laughs> um, I just wanted to thank you both, Cheryl and Stan, for the opportunity to show this beautiful comprehensive exhibit and to allow us to really explore your creative journey at such depth and for allowing us to share it with our audience. So um, it's been just a joy and uh, thank you. Um, however, it is important that you know that while the physical exhibit is ending, the collaboration with the artists is not. So all of the works are as far away as a phone call and they are still available. You just reach out. Um, we began this evening with our a debut of our exhibition video made by Jason Ruth, Ruscio. Oh my goodness, excuse me, made by Jason Ruscio. And if you missed any part of it, uh, please don't worry. We will repeat it at the end. And next, I would like to take you through a slideshow presentation. We are going to be moving through the gallery front to back and into each artist's section at which point the artists will then join us to discuss their work. At the end of the presentation, please don't go away. We will have a Q&A. To that point, if you have questions for any one of the artists, you may uh, type them into your chat button. At the bottom of your Zoom screen is a chat window. And then um, after the slideshow presentation is over, we will look at those and field them to the artists and they can um, answer them. So let's get started. I'm going to share my screen. Everybody hold your breath. Here we go. That was sharing the screen. We did it. Okay, let me move you guys over here. Okay, let's see if this is going to work. So this is fragments and where we were. Uh, participating artists are Siri France, Jane Marshall, and Martha Stevens, and of course, Cheryl Rutka and Stan Johnson. Ah, that's not working, there we go. Um, I thought I would begin with a show statement. The show statement for Fragments, and it extends also into this chapter of where we were, is that when viewed up close, the parts of our lives may seem fragmented, but they add up to one cohesive whole. Viewed at a distance, such as time, the image comes into focus. The ripples of distortion are quieted. Our fragmentation is healed. When contemplating our individual circumstances or humanity as a whole, whether examined through the allegorical lens of mythology, or distilling concrete personal memories, trading movement and stillness like water reflections, we return to a place of unity. 
Whichever our passage, we arrive at the same truth. We are not the tree, we are the forest. So this is a perfect segue into um, where we were, part one, which is of course the abstracts. These are digital paintings on aluminum by Cheryl Rutka and Stan Johnson, as you can see. Um, so these are digital paintings on aluminum. And um, this is the largest exhibit of the creative team to date. And it serves as both retrospective as well as debut exhibit of their large scale aluminum prints as well as their most recent three-dimensional constructions, as well as their new series of three panel paintings on aluminum. And all of these abstract creations are on aluminum and bear that in mind when we get to part two of this exhibit, which is photographs. And with that, we arrive at our first artist in fragments, which is Jane Marshall. Jane is exhibiting a new series called Water Portraits. These are photographs printed on aluminum and they are based on a tile mosaic that Jane created many years ago. But then she felt inspired to revisit that work and explore it with a new perspective and a different intention. So with that, please welcome Jane Marshall. Jane, are you there? Can you unmute your microphone? There. there. You are. Wonderful. Thank you, Petra. And uh, yes, these were actually photographs taken uh, in a garden that I designed in a swimming pool that is completely uh, tiled. There's mosaic tile throughout the all the side and the bottom. and. About three or four weeks ago, or maybe a little longer, you had an exhibition uh, and there was a lady from um, Vietnam and she had taken some photographs that I thought were astounding. Be they were reflective of the portraits of some ladies that were carrying salt. And I was so moved by that. I was really struck as to reflecting, as to the reflection of, of who these people were in, in their humility and their kindness. And it struck me, especially now, that we are at a, at a time of reflection. This is um, because of, in a sense, we're being forced to reflect. And I remember uh, not too long ago, the uh, great uh, Ai Weiwei, had, uh, he was asked if it was better to be an artist or an activist. Mm -hmm. And he paused and he said, an artist is an activist. Um, for the past year, we've been given an opportunity to pause and reflect and find ways to feel grateful. When the body feels grateful, it feels better and not afraid. We hear the words, we are in this together. We need to act as one. Here is what I believe. We are creatures of the earth and we can be grateful for how earth sustains us. Without water, we would not survive. I could never have practiced landscape design for over 40 years without water. With my water portraits, I celebrate water as the artist. And I offer these images to reflect and treasure the movement of how water passes through, in and around and protects us. I'd ask, let's actively defend our nature. Thank you. Beautiful. That is beautiful. Thank you. Absolutely. Did you um, have any uh, also, were there any differences in how you approached these two pieces, for instance? I believe yeah, there, there's series. It, this, one of the reasons why I say that, that the, the water is the artist is it, it also goes to light. It mm -hmm. also goes to how light is playing on water. And in a sense, if, if you just let something begin to happen, and there's a spontaneity to observing 
and, and letting something unfold on its own. So there were a lot of photos, photos that I took, but in particular, I just, I could see that what the light was doing for a, a nanosecond. I mean, these things, you know, this doesn't, it, as soon as the earth moves with the sun, this disappears. Mm. So it's almost like, you mentioned a forest. It's always like when you walk through a forest, it, it, you're cha immediately something changes because it's happening so fast. And that's what's happening right now. I'm just, you know, our, our world is really, really changing, but there are constants. And the constant, one of the constants we have is water. Mm. And one of the ways that water, it's like the amniotic fluid. It's the way we float. It's how you feel. It's how you are, you are relieved. And it's like, I just, you get to the point where rain, we finally have rain today in Los Angeles. Mm. There's, there's something that the, where, where light and water plays on itself, you begin to realize that there is a rhythm and we are part of that rhythm. There's part of what, in a sense, what we have to do is allow it to happen and allow the energies that we don't want to participate in just to pass it on and not get caught. And this is what I was seeing is, is the movement of water and the movement of this that I really didn't have much to do with. Certainly I did the mosaic patterns and I drew the, the, the composition on the, on the walls of the pool. And then I had a mason come in there and, and it took a year and a half to do this. But what I'm saying is that it happens that it happens in a second mm -hmm. and it's like if you can feel and at any time there's a certain level of gratitude see we, in this particular one you could see where what water was moving very quickly mm -hmm. over a certain surface and then the light just boom came in there and actually i call these brush strokes right the light and the water are actively making a brush stroke and i just happened to be there well yeah i mean i but I, to take this shot and then to I kind of edit it, certainly just, these are, these are close up images of a much of a bigger uh, uh, photo, but there was something so kind of captivating. And, and I want you to just sort of like, if I can have somebody lose themselves in this, in either wonder or it's like, oh, isn't it, because this is like, this is a series of single pieces of tile that are being washed by light and water. And that was interesting to me. That was, that was something that I, quite frankly, de I am dependent upon, not just by my, in my physical body, but in my you know, financial world. I mean, this is why you know, I, I do, but I am a painter. So this, these two things kind of came together for me. And that's what I love. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of, at this point, kind of knitting my gardens with my visual. And it's just, it's fun. It's fun. I'm having fun. I love it. And it's also incredibly beautiful. And I've always, you know, I, I um, take other lessons out of these things as well. And to me, this whole series is kind of a, a testament to the fact that the creative process is ongoing and cyclical. Yeah. And that, you know, you never know when an artwork or the idea behind the artwork is truly finished, you know, because you, you may return to it one day and examine it in a new way. Mm -hmm. And also, I think it's so interesting, the fact that you were inspired by other artists' artwork, which is of course so, so important. As a wonderful reminder to artists, you know, by nature, we're, we're also self-critical um, of our work and of ourselves, but especially of the work, it's a good reminder not to judge because ultimately, you know, the work is there to serve others. You never know how it might inspire someone, how it might move someone or inspire them even. So it's- um, It might just shatter the whole thing and, or maybe fold it up like a gum, you know, or just break it up and like, what? Anyway, it's, it's, it is fun. It is fun. Yeah. So, you know, it's-, it's <laughs> I love it. Yeah. And, and I hope it's shiny because I love the metal. Cheryl, I love that, you know, the metal, the whole idea is because it shines. Yeah. yeah, and it also perfectly beautifully blends with the rest of the show with all this gorgeous metal aluminum work. So again, thank you, Jean. Sensational new series. Bravo. Love it. Um, this brings us to our next artist, which is Siri France. And Siri is... Um, 
exhibiting a beautiful diptych entitled, I hope I don't mispronounce it, Tila Wukit trees. And I learned from Siri that these are actually a form of aspen trees. I thought they were birches, but they are apparently not. But what I adore is also just this wonderful looseness and abstraction that, that Siri brings to this painting, which up close is very abstract and not realistic at all. But when you step back, it comes into focus and it becomes incredibly a, a realistic image. And the feeling is incredibly real. And um, that kind of became sort of the, the theme or the tenor for this show as well, the idea that when we step, but the fragmentation in front of us reveals itself and comes into focus and unifies into a whole when we step back. So um, the last few years have been such a whirlwind and especially this last year that we're only now beginning to kind of gain perspective. And um, those are just some of the many things that, that this piece evokes in me. So anyway, please welcome with that series. Hello, thank you for that. And I, and I like the view kind of looking up at the trees that you have there. This is a detail, a bigger piece. But I like the detail, that was kind of great. And um, yeah, thanks for what you said about the, the you know, pulling back and getting focus. Um, because that's actually what I was kind of aiming for. So I'm happy about that. And um, Tilawake is actually not a type of a tree. It's the name of a, of a ranch that I was in, in Colorado. And I just love the name, so that's why it's called Tilawake Trees. I was, um, I was leading an art retreat in Colorado, in Southern Colorado. And um, we were in this just lovely ranch, surrounded by trees of all kinds. But I got particularly taken by the aspen because there are lots, you know, it's Colorado, there's a lot of aspen there. And um, there's something about the, the just ghostliness of their white trunks and they've just got such grace. Um, so kind of what I was trying to do, I mean, I came back from this retreat with a ton of images in my head and on paper and as usual kind of worked on about 200 at the same time. Um, but it, it's kind of, it's interesting. So I was trying to think, well, what was I trying to do in a picture like this? And it's so much about, it's about kind of two things. Um, one of them is just trying to get that feeling across of, of how you feel in the presence of these sort of trees because there's something about especially being alone in a, in a place surrounded by just trees that is um it's got such a profound effect uh there's this kind of presence you know and there's a stillness and silence and something about just them being not saying anything just being there these other beings that, that, that are kind of rooted in the ground uh, can't go anywhere. We, there's such a mystery. They're obligingly giving us oxygen, just like what Jane was saying about this kind of, you know, um, amazing cycle that we're part of. And, um, and yeah, so just get, getting that feeling across. And uh, the other thing is that so, something about the visual effect of landscape is very sort of profound, I think, for most people. It certainly is for me. And there's something about the lines, the simplicity of lines um, here. That was what I was trying to get across really was this balance between um, the simple composition of the trees and, and then this very complex stuff that, as James was saying, ever-changing stuff and texture and depth that's happening behind them. And kind of somehow, sort of, it's always about balance, isn't it? It's like some balancing two things. And sometimes it's kind of easy and sometimes it's a bit of a struggle. Um, but in this case, it, it just grew. I came back to the studio, I was working on one piece 
just one half of this diptych and um, it kind of grew and became bigger. Um, and in fact, it was entirely different when it started. It was, it was painted over a completely different uh, composition, which is usually the case with my work. So that's why you can see these sort of depths of different um, wash. It was actually quite washy at the beginning. Um, and I gradually sort of built it up and up. And I think used a lot of palette knife in this piece. Um, so I wanted to keep those earlier layers um, showing because they contributed to all that depth so that when you do go close to this picture, yeah, you just see a whole jumble of stuff and, and then you come back and you've just got these very sort of hopefully clean lines. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's about it. Beautiful. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really incredible. The, the, all of the things that you mentioned, the, the depth of the color and the fact that you achieve it by through layers of different colors. And that just kind of pulls you in even further and further. And, and how you do it, I, I just do not know. How you're able to just kind of then create a line this close and it end up being in the perfect position and the perfect depth and, and adding up to this experience of a tree that we recognize that it just seems like you must have just known where to put it because no no you never know I mean I, I I kind of know and then I don't know and then I change it and then I you know you talk to I think any of the artists here will, will recognize that process you you kind of and you're sometimes with that knocking back and that sort of changing about with lines will Will help the composition, will help the feel of, of the painting anyway, but it's never like that's going to go there and it's not going to go into It's usually a lot of changing about and, and editing that happens in the process. You but know, really, certainly my pictures. Yeah, yeah that, that's kind of what's amazing about it. It seems everything seems so specifically placed and it is so balanced that it's, uh, uh, it seems like it was, you know, obviously just meant to be that way. <laughs> Well, thanks, Petra. And thank you for including me in this show. I, I love what you were talking about, Jane, as well. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful piece. And we're so, so excited and delighted to show it. Um, okay. So that brings us, last but not least, to our final fragments artist, Martha Stevens. And I am not seeing Martha's visual right now. Martha, are you there? Martha? Yes, ah. I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in addition to, I'm sorry, I actually was going to begin with an introduction and I got ahead of myself. In addition to being an amazing artist, Martha is also a professional storyteller. And the other day I had a um, client in the gallery who I shared that with, that Martha is a professional storyteller. And he mentioned that he could absolutely see that in the paintings. He said it's apparent that, that she's a, a verbal artist and, and a musician in a way. Because he says, as a, as a storyteller, you just have an inherent sense of rhythm and that rhythm informs you. And he says, you can see that rhythm in the way that she has deconstructed these lines and shifted them. But there's, as you move through the painting, top to bottom, left to right, you're experiencing syncopation and a rhythm. So I thought that was so brilliant that I asked him if I could steal it. <laughs> and he very generously allowed me to do that. So welcome, Martha Stevens. Um, please tell us a little bit about your work. Thank you, Petra. It's, it's really lovely to be part of this. I, I thank you. Um, it, this whole series really painted itself. Um, all, of, all of the paintings come from stories that I have told, but the paintings were never intentional. It was like one day I was sitting in front of a canvas and Demeter walked in 
and climbed up in the middle of this canvas and kind of moved around. Demeter was corn goddess in Greece and she had a young daughter, Persephone. And the two of them were always together and symbolized the green corn and the ripe ear. Um, well, Persephone came in, wanted to be up there and then Hecate, who is an old crone came in and they are, the triple goddess. You find them in many different mythologies in Ireland, in Egypt, in India, in Sumeria. You find the triple goddess, the maiden, the mother, and the crone. And um, the three of them got up there and then suddenly pigs came running in and jumped up on the canvas. And I thought, pigs, it aroused my curiosity and I went and did some reading and found that pig was the totem animal of Demeter and, and many goddess figures, um, which I thought was really fascinating. A pig was associated a lot with the feminine and, and we have Miss Piggy. <laughs> uh, after the pigs, the apples kind of dropped in and I thought they should really be pomegranates. But the triple goddess also is the the great goddess or the great mother and I thought well why don't we give a nod to Eve <laughs> mm -hmm. and I left the apples there and then the skulls came and they seemed very right for often the the great mother is one who gives life but also takes it and um it, it was really interesting painting this uh, because it's it's so different from telling a story and it's like just getting under the skin of it mm. uh, I just I just found it so moving and I I love the stories they're they're about what it means to be human and they help me to get through life and 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 see things in a a broader way. Uh, this is just really the characters of one story. It's just a fragment. And it is in kind of fragments because it's always moving. And the thing about stories is that every time a story is told, it's told a little bit differently. And I've told the same story in, in different parts of the world. And people always come up and say, oh, we tell that same story, a little bit differently, but it's the same story. <laughs> and, and that we all really, if you go down deep enough, tell the same story. Um, this has been an amazing week and a week of great relief. <laughs> uh, the, the word sacrifice and the word injustice has been used a lot. And this is Prometheus, who is just a symbol of sacrifice. Um, Prometheus, Zeus, the father of the gods, asked Prometheus to create man. And, and so he did. His brother had made the animals and Prometheus used the same form for man, but he made man to walk on two legs instead of four so he could walk and look at the stars at the same time. But Zeus wondered what this man was going to be like. And Prometheus started looking at man and the animals and he thought, you know, animals have much more protection and more power than men because every animal has a protection. A turtle has a shell, a snake has a bite, a bee has a sting, but Prometheus had nothing with which to protect himself. And Prometheus loved his creation so much that he wanted to give man something no other creature had. And he thought and thought and finally he said fire. I'm going to give man fire. Now this was a bold and dangerous thought because fire was sacred. Only the gods were to have it, but Prometheus was determined. And so he stole a hot coal from the fire pit, took it back and gave it to man. And not only that, he taught man how to use the power, how to create with it, how to make tools and weapons, how to cook his food with it, how to keep warm, to scare away wild animals. 
But Zeus was furious that Prometheus had give, given his creation that, that puny little man, sacred fire, and he punished Prometheus. And the punishment was he was taken high up in the Caucasus Mountains and chained to a rock. And every day this huge bird would come down and peck out his liver. And every night the wound would heal. So the bird came back day after day, after week, after month, and still Zeus was angry. Now Prometheus, Prometheus was immortal. And so this punishment would go on forever. And it was so unjust and it was so painful. And I just, and he did this because he loved his creation so much. Mm. And I just, I just love Prometheus. I, I could feel his suffering. I could feel his cry for injustice. Uh, Aeschylus wrote a great play about it, Prometheus Unbound, uh, where he cries out, why, why, why this injustice? Uh, there are other parts of the story in there. There's, there's the centaur who was a great teacher and healer and who sacrificed his own immortality so that Prometheus eventually was freed. And there was Io, a cow who, <laughs> who was once a beautiful girl that Zeus tried to seduce and uh, his wife found them and Zeus turned her into a cow, but she wandered up into the Prometheus, uh, uh, to see Prometheus and asked him if she could ever return to her natural form. But this is what came out and there's the dark and the light and it, it's something with these paintings because I don't feel I painted them. They, they seem to paint themselves Wow. Extraordinary, Martha. Wow. Thank you. I'm speechless. I don't even know what to say. It's <laughs> your, your love for the story is so evident, but also your love for this character is so evident in the painting. And, and again, the great detail to which you go is, is just phenomenal. And um, it's funny, you touched on something that was one of my little notes that I made. Uh, Again, I see sort of the visual echo of that very fact that you mentioned of the oral tradition and how stories change. And I felt like that augmentation, that slight shift was almost represented in that beautiful fragmentation that you created in the sections, you know, where the, the same line might be continued, continued slightly shifted, you know, slightly different shade, it doesn't align and that's, that's just the organic development, you know, as tell us yeah. and live it and experience it. But I, and I love how always there's these, these wonderful circles that happen and how what you're saying about the painting painted itself ties back to what Jane said in the beginning of the artist in that series was the water, was the light. And it created itself. She was there to observe it and to capture it. And that's also what mm -hmm. Sierra said in a, in a way. You know, you guys are, yeah. you take the moment, the feeling, and you, you capture it in the way that you do. Wow, you guys are all incredible. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And this is a perfect segue to our amazing uh, solo retrospective show. So we're now entering part one abstracts of Cheryl Retka and Stan Johnson, where we work. So these are digital paintings on aluminum and they're created in a process called dye sublimation. So this is a process that uses heat and pressure to transfer pigment into the surface material. And I've created an overview of the individual pieces so that uh, you can have a slightly closer look at them um, because it's a little bit harder to uh, see the details, especially uh, in the wides. So all of these works, again, are on the website. So if I go too fast, you can revisit them there. And, and entering Stan's section, I wanted to start with Stan's statement. He says, 
I am a structural expressionist. At first, the two concepts seem ill-suited. But this awkward, synthesis, sorry, this awkward synthesis creates a dynamic of tension in my work. By altering structure, expression in the figure, and expression, structure, in the ground, the forces at play can be reconciled. And sorry, I went one too fast. Um, so next up is then Cheryl's statement. And Cheryl says, my work is personal, poetic, and lyrical. Emphasis is given to form, texture, and color. Each field, the figure, and the ground is meticulously arranged for maximum effect. It is my goal to elicit a familiar and pronounced mood in each of my viewers. So Cheryl and Stan have been working as a team for nearly 25 years. They typically work on separate pieces, but in a very collaborative way. And as a result, their styles have morphed into, for me, almost a kind of symbiosis. And at times it's difficult to tell apart for me which artist created which piece. But what is so impressive to me is how they keep pushing boundaries, mm -hmm. each other's and their own. And they do it in such a beautiful collaborative way. And I just think that's what true creative partnership is all about. So with that, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Cheryl Rutka and Stan Johnson. And I believe we're going to start with Stan tonight. Stan, did you want to tell us about Metronome? And let's see what the next one up is, Food Fight. Stan, are you with us? I am. Yay. My audio is, is working. Uh, metronome is about time and entropy. It is uh, the winding down of a mainspring and uh, the realization of that passage that things move along swimmingly at first and then begin to deteriorate over time. It just slows down. Um, you become more aware of that, that rite of passage and you become more sensitive to it. And of course you want to portray it as best you can. Um, this was the original design of the piece. The spiral elements mimic the mainspring of the metronome, and uh, it's done in a fairly aggressive manner where the figure actually literally floats over the ground, and I mean literally. Uh, and uh, it's, it's done with aggressive colors and uh, I'm fairly happy with it. There's always something you can do better, but that's pretty much the uh, the story with that. That's, that's wonderful, and and to, again, to me, you know, I always receive the the symbolism and metaphors when I look at this piece, and so because it's a metronome and because it is so imposing, um, and the th the third dimension also makes it even more so. Uh, to me, it very much becomes the story of time and the hand of time and there's there's something godlike about it just this this tempestuous sky behind it and and it's 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 almost like you we can hear it you know we can hear the the sound just by looking at it even though it's not literally there you've just kind of brought it right there and um again because it's three-dimensional i tried to include this little detail here so you can see a side view, but um, of course, it's best experienced in person. Anyway, great piece, Stan. Thank you. Um, tell us about Food Fight. Well, if you go to the dentist's office, <laughs> okay, there's always a, an aquarium and it's supposed to calm you down. Well, nature really isn't like that. Um, and fish are as aggressive as any other animal. And uh, 
So I, I combined the technical aspect of the dentist drill with the fish that are out front in the foyer. And uh, this, this was the result. And uh, it, it belies the, the calmness of the aquarium with the actual aggressiveness of the situation. And uh, I think we are all, we're all fearful these days of something. But in, in the course of a normal life, an extended normal life, the dentist really is not your friend, okay? Mm -hmm. And th this is what this was about. It's, it's fantastic. It's, and it's also bizarrely, it's very beautiful. As terrifying as it is, you know, there's this incredible, almost Alice in Wonderland-esque beauty to these creatures. They, they uh, remind me, like they, they, yeah, they, they are fish and, and they're, they're gorgeous, they're regal, and yet they're deadly. So, mm. wow, bravo, and you are hilarious. You just crack me up to no end. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, next up is your creative partner in crime, Cheryl Rutka. Cheryl, are you with us? I just saw her. We seem to have lost her screen. She called me briefly and said that she wasn't. Uh... Oh no. Can, um, hmm, let me see. Let me go check my phone, see if I can do anything to help. Oh, hmm. Well, I guess I, I wanted, I will talk a little bit about um, this piece then for Cheryl and, and hopefully, I don't know, Anthony, if you're listening, our man behind the curtain, if you, if Cheryl, can make, if he tries to make contact again, um, if you can maybe let her in. I um, will. Oh, thank you. I can't see where to do that. Like I can't find the window where to do that. So I'll try to talk a little bit about this piece. And Stan, please augment because you were there during the creation because again, you guys, you work so closely. I believe you speak every day. Mm -hmm. and, oh, absolutely. And a lot of times you also, you know, actively collaborate on one piece. Do you have a memory of how this piece first came into being for Cheryl? Uh, it was probably a, a single piece that was, you know, the minute I put words in Sherry's mouth, I get hammered, okay? I, I just want you to know that I'm jumping off a cliff here because Sherry is perfectly capable of speaking for herself. Yes. Course. But this was probably a rotated single piece that was chopped into cubic space and rearranged in, in three dimensions. Uh, okay. Sherry has a very good geometric sense, excellent color sense, and uh, the arrangements augment the depth of the piece. There are actually three different planes in this piece. There is the background, the foreground, and the middle ground. And there are three separate elements to this piece that are floating on top of each other. So there is a dialogue in the space that's, that's literal and figurative. Um, I happen to like this piece. It, it, it's a very strong piece. The son of a bitch is heavy. <laughs> uh, okay, but, guys, I have no idea. Are you hearing me? Yes. No, no, no. Clear as a bell. I'm what? Clear as a bell. We can hear you. Okay. So for some reason, everybody's going to say I'm unmuted or muted. No, you're not muted. <laughs> I have no idea what's going on. Well, <laughs> let <You're> me. On. <laughs> Put, put it this way, I'm still alive. Yay, that's good. Yay, so out from center was an amazing piece for me. And it was a piece where you had asked where we started the 3D and I'm going, 
we need to take um, our art to the next level, but we can't do it for every piece, mm -hmm. but we can do it for individual pieces. And this was a piece where I could do it at the beginning, where I could do it very simply in a rectangle or a square and do it. And so um, that's how it started. And believe me, Nana Gans was the second piece and it was so challenging because I had, you're doing a nonagon, nine-sided, um, where I had to individually separate the background to a nine-sided image to print it out without any background. Hmm. That was challenging. Fascinating. Really, really great. An another thing that, that really kills me about this piece is I would have never thought that those two colors would look so beautiful together the gray and the yellow, and then these touches of oranges and red, but it seems like the, the highlights of it, it's just the impeccably tasteful and bright, and I really learned something. So I thought that's just a really great sense of design. And uh, Stan also took us through the three different levels of the piece, um, just fantastic piece. And yes, very heavy. <laughs> Very. Okay. I don't want to install that again. <laughs> um, the next piece, however, should be a lot easier. It was not as heavy. Will you tell us about this one, Cheryl? Um, this one was actually a piece where I was trying to, my idea was ugly on the outside, beautiful on the inside. And um, uh, Tucson has this gem, gem show every year. And you have these geodes where you have these absurd, ugly rocks, but you crack them open and they're actually exquisite mm. on the inside. And it's a reflection of people as well. And I created this image and then I was thinking 3D, how, how could I do this 3D? So I actually created a diamond um, to emphasize the inside and made that image. And so it was built, so it was attached to the original geode to match up, but it was 3D. Yeah, beautiful. Really, really great job. And I love, um, again, of course, the metaphor of the diamond, creating the diamond and the diamond in the rough. And there's multiple metaphors. Exactly. But what's so interesting about abstracts, and I don't think a lot of people realize that abstracts can be you know, the artist presents them, you know, I present this image as a vertical, but this image can be, be turned as a horizontal. You know, the panels we created, 
can be turned as horizontals. And so the whole idea of abstracts is that people see what they want to see, but they have to be able to see what they can't see. They have to be able to rotate mm. and visualize because there's so much in abstracts. I'm stealing that, Cheryl. You just gave me another new favorite quote about abstract art, which is you must see what you cannot see. And I love that. You must be able to see what you cannot see. I just, that's great. Thank you, honey. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Gorgeous, gorgeous piece, gorgeous work. Um, and again, I, I know I said this last month, but um, I wanted to just kind of say this again. I, I commend you both so much also for taking up the mantle of digital art and knowing in the similar way as, as photography had to kind of you know, earn its way into the canon to be taken seriously or to be considered a, a rightful art form, legitimate art form. You guys have really spearheaded that, that journey and that transition for digital art. I think you guys are largely responsible for um, allowing people to, to experience it and, and to see um, how meaningful and legitimate it is, as opposed to these crazy notions that it wasn't um, labor intensive or that it didn't require artistry. I mean, there were all of these People didn't understand digital art at all. They thought maybe it was, like you mentioned, I think a press, a push of a button and it was all just created as opposed to the art form that it is, which involves multiple layers and shapes and, and, and the same composition and all of, and color theory, everything that you need. Um, so congrats, you, you guys, um, have taken this uh, about 10 steps further. So thank you. And um, this then brings us to how you started, to your photography show. And um, so this is like I mentioned, has used how you started. And as I mentioned, your abstract work for me sometimes is symbiotic and um, meaning it's sometimes it's, it's hard for me to know which artist created which piece because your aesthetics are so aligned. But in your photography, actually, you two are quite, quite distinct. And Cheryl's work is more often centered around street photography and portraiture. And um, Stan's photography tends to examine more the duality of nature versus uh, civilization, or as I'm borrowing this, uh, Stan said, the court world versus the green world, which I love. So I created, again, an overview of the images, and I took the liberty of combining them in a way um, that I thought they related to each other, um, based on not only the narrative elements, but also the aesthetic alignment. And um, I wanted to also show the, the feeling that they have in common, as well as um, <laughs> the humor and um, the ways in which they are separate. I mean, your journey is so inspiring. And um, also a note about Cheryl's work is that she started photographing her subjects indirectly and then over time um, was able to engage them in a more direct dialogue with a camera. And um, of course, Stan always brings to it some signature elements as well, the element of existentialism, as well as the use of um, long exposure and uh, the wrong title card and his love for architecture and sense of humor. Both artists have such a 
lovely sense of humor and love of humanity, which I think unifies them. Kind of a perfect yin and yang you two are. So um, please tell us a little bit, Cheryl, about Mother's Hands. Oh, um, my mother and we did not get along. Um, we got along, but we did not get along. There's were always differences. My mother was a very, she was a, feminist to the nth degree and she was always a um, she was a head of an English department at a public high school she worked so hard and there were times when I would see her sit and fold her hands. And I always looked at those hands. And I commented on to her once on these and she was embarrassed. She was so self-conscious about her veins and her hands. And to me, they were lovely. They were so expressive. They were her. They were all about her hard work. And she let me photograph them. And actually, Pedro, now I look at my hands and I'm seeing the veins and the calluses and stuff. But um, these hands are a working woman. These hands are life. They are reality. They, they mean so much because they are reality. Yeah, you nailed it. They are so real. That's why I just find them exquisitely beautiful. Um, the, the, I, I forget. Yeah somebody spoke about lines and and our skin and veins and all of those things and how they are almost snapshots of our experiences you know they're they're chapters they're all of those are moments that we lived years that we lived and it's as such it's just it's 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 beauty they're like the rings in a tree if you if you cut it open it's just um and there's such grace and and dignity in the gesture. There's also almost something religious about it. Religious, not in the academic sense or anything. Right. In the what I mean, so spiritual. There's there's a devotion. There's a a devotion in the gesture, and um, it's just you just nailed it. I'm so glad you saw that, and I'm so glad you captured it. Thank you. You're welcome. I am too, because. It, you know, I look at these hands and I have a, actually a picture of this on my bedroom wall. Um, yeah. They are real. They are real, exactly. That was what I wrote down when you were talking, the fact that this is reality. Yeah. And um, it's the perfect capture. Thank you. Oops. Wrong one. So, oh, Louise. One more, Louise, please. Okay. Louise was um, 
when Stan and I first started this uh, company, uh, we went to Canyon de Chez, and this was back in 97, 96. And, whatever. and we literally were, we were driven down into this canyon. This is so deep. We were driven down into the canyon and we were taking pictures of Canyon Deshaies and some whatever. And we said, okay, we're gonna walk back up to the rim. So um, we started walking and there was Louise and her sheep. And I said, can I take a picture? And she said, yeah, what are you going to pay me? So I paid her, actually, I didn't have any money. So Stan gave me two bucks. I paid her two bucks for this image. And then we started walking back up this canyon. And you have no idea how high this canyon is. And she's this Navajo woman who has a little farm down there. And she walks this probably daily. Mm -hmm. She walked past us. She literally zoomed past us. And this was like 30 years ago. And I'm going, we're sitting on this bench helping puff, Puffy and she's going by. We were so embarrassed. But that's Louise. Wow. It's it's so great. When I when I first saw the piece before you told me the story, I of course instantly thought that. The sheep's name was Louise. <laughs> I don't know why. I just love the, the devotion in which, again, the sheep looks at her. There is so much love in, in that look. Um, I don't know if she like, expects to be fed very quickly or uh, soon, but I just I think it's a great image. And again, so many lovely visual details. The, the, um, the diagonals of the rock sediment behind her just makes for really interesting composition. Once again, good, great eye. So I'm so, I'm so thrilled that we got to show these photographs um, along with your abstracts, which brings us to your original photography mentor, Stan Johnson. Is that right, Stan? Uh Probably, of course, you've, you've, you've got to be careful. <laughs> I love People come to things for different reasons. And, uh, but I, I happen to like this shot for the simple reason that uh, it, it shows us for some, the hyperbole that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And I brought this up before, but that, that religion is the opiate of the people, but it really isn't. That opiate is hyperbole. In an existential sense, religion is an, an air mattress. Now the ground is still very cold, but it's not as hard, okay? And this is what, what this particular print was about. Again, it's taken right on the edge of civilization. If you go over that wall, it's nothing but choya, mesquite, high desert. It's, uh, and you have the idea of the Buddha trying to supersede his reality, ignore the air mattress, ignore the court world, ignore the green world. And, and yet this is some sort of incense or fireworks truck that is, is parked in a parking lot someplace uh, outside of Quartzsite, Arizona, which is sort of a, a low life. <laughs> uh, you'd have to call it, well, it's a, a flea market, a giant flea market. And uh, there are no quality products there. You have velvet paintings, moccasins, corn dogs, and that's about it. And, and rocks, of course, rocks are big. 
But uh, it's a very interesting place. Love quartzite. It suits my ethos as well as any place I've ever been. Fantastic. And I, I just love also, again, you know, composition and the, the, the sparseness, the way it's everything is placed. And the fact that this one flag is pitched inward just a little bit as if they're in dialogue, you know, as if they're sort of responding or leaning towards the Buddha. It's just um, beautiful. Really, really love these works. Um, especially- However, if, you, if anybody knows the translation of the Chinese or Korean on the outside, on the let outside. me know. Yeah. I'd no. like to know what the, the truck says. Oh. I no, no clue. So call out to any of you who can read this scripture. Let us know what that oh. is. Um, next, would you tell me a little bit about subsidence, another one of my faves? Well, uh, oddly enough, my nephews, who are considerably younger than I, I love this print. So it seems to uh, appeal to people of all ages. And it's an incongruity. Clearly you don't have your sofa stuck in the middle of a blasted landscape any more than you have a swing set in your living room. You know, it's just, it's, it's not an idea. But also the, the, the overriding geologic principle of, of passage, you can subside into this horrible sofa with your bowl of popcorn and your iced tea and, you know, watch wrestling, for example. But when you take this thing out and leave it in a barren landscape, the sofa itself starts to subside. The structure of it begins to fail. The, um, obviously the fabric begins to fail. In 150 years, the only thing that will be left of this is a couple of springs and a couple of screws in the ground. Now, it gets worse or better, depending on your point of view. The landscape itself will subside. So you've got the subsidence of a human being into the couch, the subsidence of the couch into the ground, and the landscape itself subsiding. So again, the passage of time and the inevitability of it. Beautiful. Love, love, love. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. So again, I know I've expressed how much I, I love this work and I just really appreciate being able to see how you guys started and how your aesthetics evolved. And also a little side note, because I know you shared with me how when exploring the photography, you guys became interested in experimentation and that that had sort of catastrophic consequences at times that, you know, when trying to destroy or, or distort the negative, but then digital came along and it was sort of the answer to your, your prayers in, in that sense that it gave you a vehicle with which to manipulate, distort and experiment. Um, originally with your images and then moving on beyond that into pure abstraction. So really excellent way, great way to, to show an artist's journey. Again, that's why I'm so grateful that we were able to share this with everyone. Um, so this completes our two exhibits, the presentation aspect of it, fragments and where we were, parts one and two. And uh, next, we uh, would like to ask everyone to join us for a Q&A with the artist. This will be very interesting. So Petra, do you see that you have a number of questions in the Q&A box? Oh no, not in the uh, Okay, so at the bottom of your Zoom screen, look for Q&A and press the button. I do see a notification. Now, I guess I'll start with Q&A and then we can move over to chat or we'll, we'll do both. Let me see. Um, these are just wonderful testaments and comments, which I um, want to, ah, no, this is a question. Okay, so the first question is, first 
lovely. Uh, this is such a beautiful event. Thank you for giving us a chance to appreciate these pieces all the way from Woodland Hills. I would be really interested in hearing about Martha's journey to Prometheus. Was there a specific poetic or dramatic interpretation of that story that stuck with you? Martha. Oh, unmute yourself. Martha, you're muted. Okay. Um, my journey to... Prometheus. Oh, Prometheus? Mm -hmm. Prometheus? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> my journey to Prometheus. Uh, it, it, I was very involved in Greek mythology for a time. I was, uh, one of the things I was doing was working in schools, uh, telling stories to uh, middle and high schoolers alongside of their social studies, which was in uh, ninth grade and sixth grade, uh, Greek mythology and Egyptian. And so I, I got very interested in, in that and started reading a lot. I've always loved the theater and, um, and love the Greek tragedies and Prometheus Bound is one of them. Uh, it, it's a story I think about the creator, about a creator uh, it's a story about love and injustice. There's another pa painting that I that that is in there of Cain and Abel, and that also is of injustice. And um, these are stories that you can really talk about forever because uh, they're like two sides of a coin being right there, and you have the God who is. Uh, all powerful and but he's also unjust at times and uh terribly unjust and <laughs> and the poor schlup <laughs> who is is the one who's the target is is oh, beware um prometheus I like creation stories. I think they're really interesting and there are all kinds of creation stories. And this one, this one is also, the story goes on that Zeus isn't happy just punishing Prometheus the way he is. And he decides to punish that puny little creation of his man and decides he'll send something down to pester him day and night. And he decides he's going to make a woman and, uh, <laughs> So he scoops up some clay and and creates a woman and she happens to be, well, he asks all the gods to give her a gift and they all give her the gift of wisdom and one gives her love and beauty and one teaches her music. And they finally name her Pandora because Pan means all and Pandora is gift of all the gods. And then Zeus gives her a little box beautifully carved and tells her, take this and you have to go and live on the earth now, but keep the box with you always, never open it. But of course the time comes when she just says, what's in there? He gave it to me, there must be something for me in there. And she finally does open it and all the ills of the world come out of it. And you know, hatred and justice and war and death and, and uh, she slams the lid down and just weeps. What have I done? But she hears a little voice inside saying, open up, open up. And I'm different than the others. Let me out. And she finally lets this, this creature out. And it, it is different. It's beautiful. It has all the rainbow colors. And she says, who are you? And the creature says, I'm hope. And uh, I was put in the box just in case the others were let loose. And she says, will you stay here with me always? And Hope says, yes. Although sometimes it will seem I've left the world forever. But when you least expect me, I'll be there. And so it was, the world knows all of those things of 
death and hatred and jealousy and greed and all the things we've been experiencing the last four years. <laughs> uh, anyway, that I just, I love the story. I think it's a beautiful story. Thank you. I love that you love the elder. Thank you. Um, wow. Uh, there's the next question is for Jane. It's uh, to Jane Marshall. Did you use film or digital camera and does it make a difference? Also, at what angle did you shoot the pool in the first slide, such as straight down or at a lower angle? I used my phone, my iPhone, um, to take the photos. And the angle, much like what Cheryl was saying, these, you can turn these images any way. I mean, this is, the shots were actually taken from a foreground position shooting down the pool, shooting from one end of the pool. The pool is actually in the shape of a kind of a croissant. There's a, there's a kind of a, a half um, beach entrance and then you step in and then you swim around and then you step up. And so there's, this, there's a, a, a spiraling movement that is innate to the swimming pool. So there's kind of intrinsically, there is that, um, as a given. And um, so it was a pretty simple thing. I mean, just of, of, uh, using an iPhone to do this. Uh, I hope that answers the question. I just, I, I, there's a, a captivation with a, a certain moment. There's, there's like, as, as we are, yes, absolutely, Martha, in, into this time of enormous I, at least waves of emotion for me, it's just like, whoa, it's like a tidal wave of emotion. And that's why it, in a way we go with this, you know, we, we and, 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 the, and the perspective is arbitrary. It's, it, it doesn't in a sense matter. It's, it's what was being active as a display of, of how water and, and light mingle, you know, earth, air, fire, and water, the gifts, I guess keeps us going. <laughs> Thanks. Beautiful. Now there's a follow-up question to this. While you're on a roll, Jane, um, uh, an anonymous and uh, attendee has uh, written, Jane, your articulation of how water moves and its analogy to life is beautiful. Your works even surpass that articulation. Indeed, the art is an activist. What is next for you creatively? Well, <laughs> Actually, I'm very, and I, I have to say, you know, Cheryl, your mother's hands, the, the, there's, there's something about, uh, I do woodcuts, and I've just finished one that is, has a, my hand, and um, so I will continue to do that, I continue to do the, the woodcut, but it's also, uh, if it's on metal, there's a there's a exploration of I can I can make it a different size. I mean I'm not necessarily uh, tied to a a block of wood that is then printed. I can I I the 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 idea of a, a digital world has kind of opened up the possibilities. I do what's next is actually and I look at these I thought really what what might work is if you just shatter it right. What what, what would happen if I shattered water? <laughs> And what would happen if I put a different arbitrary background? We never know what we're going to get, right? It's a crapshoot. What are you going to get? You, you, you know, so, but I also like the idea of what Agam has done. I don't know if I can do that in metal. It would, it would be sort of pieces of it. But if on one angle you see something and then on the other angle you see something else, it's like stepping in somebody else's shoes, right? It's like, what do you see? I don't know. I mean, it, it, get, it is an arbitrary thing. So I, I, I start, began as a painter uh, and became a, a garden designer. And there's a fold back, there's a tying up. And it's, it's, to, it's to be grateful, really. It, it's to, to express a certain, um, here we are. And we're, we, we were doing some grading today. And I one of the guys reached down and goes, this is what we are. We're dirt, right? 
that's the, the expression of we're all bound up in all this. And so with the idea of being grateful or thanking the thanking the dirt <laughs> thanking, and thanking the rain, it's like it's just so much better than having to deal with right, Martha, with what we've been going through. It's just the emotional part of it is just overwhelming. So thank you for the question. I, I go with whatever I can that make, gives me some fun. I really enjoy doing this. I really enjoy it. You know, it's, it, I don't have to, I don't have to deal with people. You know, I just have to deal with, <laughs> I have to deal with my image and my fantasy. It's so much of a relief, you know? <laughs> oh, you are right. Well, it's beautiful. Thank you. Um, okay, the next question goes to Stan and Cheryl. Um, Stan and Cheryl, do you take multiple photos of the same subject slash setting? and then choose the most meaningful one to you? Patricia asked that. Okay, I'm not understanding that one. Hmm. May, I, may I repeat it? It's, do you take multiple photos of the same subject or setting and then choose afterwards or? Okay, in photography, yes. But we're not doing. I think that is regarding photos. I think that's what that question is addressing, photography. Yeah, of course we do. Because when you're in a situation like um, the um, image of. Um, the two images that you have on the wall. Okay, Devil's Kettle. Yeah, I took multiple images of those. Mm -hmm. um, at, as far as the fences go, no. That was an and photo, the multiple images of Devil's Kettle is I didn't have the right lens. So I took, this was an incredible image and I couldn't get it. So I took half and half mm -hmm. and I sewed them together. I sew them together to create the image of Devil's Kettle. But what I really wanted to do was create the ambiance of Devil's Kettle, which is you go to these sites and you see things like logs or signs or litter there's these aren't pristine sites you love them but they aren't pristine and so I wanted to create in Devil's Carol the fact that these are beautiful sites, but if you look to the left or the right, actually, when you look at it, it's, there's a defect. And that's life. That is life. There's nothing perfect. That's life. Deal with it, type of thing. Love it. Awesome. Thank you, Cheryl. That's perfect. Um, I have a question for Siri now. Um, an anonymous attendee writes Siri, Taylor Wookett trees, this piece is perfection. Quote, blindly giving us oxygen, unquote. I love that. A very pedestrian question. Why two canvases instead of one? Oh, well, I've got a pretty pedestrian answer for that. 
<laughs> um, <laughs> I, it started as one canvas. In fact, I have been playing around with a lot of um, dipped, and I do enjoy um, doing these diptyches, which I can never say, um, because of the way that sometimes one picture, one picture can feed into another. And in fact, I quite enjoy when I'm hanging a show, just seeing that, you know, the way that they relate to each other is always quite, can be quite surprising. But in this case, it really was, I started out as a, like I said, as a totally different picture. And then it just, it, um, it grew and it needed more space. And rather than go and get a whole new canvas, I, I wanted to kind of use what I had and just kind of, it, it grew that way. And I, and it, and it worked. If it hadn't have worked, then I probably would have tried a bigger one, but I liked it in a, in a twosome. Perfect. <laughs> Pretty straightforward answer. Thank uh, you very much for your... Industry and very sensible. Um, question for Stan. Stan, you are a contradiction I adore. You speak of division, pain, darkness, yet you and your art emanates absolute joy of life. Explain, dude. <laughs> Quote. I'm cynical and sentimental at the same time. That's it. There is no more. Love it. Uh, cynicism is the ba last bastion of the romantic, and it's it's there. It's in me. I don't. I don't. Even, you know. I'm not trying to to obfuscate issues, but it's it is an obfuscation. You can be both, and I am. Wonderful. Thank you, guys. Um, a few more. I'm going to have to skip around between also the chat one, um, but there is also a, a comment that came in. Cheryl, mother's hands, thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow. Right? Um, OK, let's go to chat and see what we've got here. This is some internal conversation. Um, ah, okay, here we go. Um, oh, no, 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 I'm so sorry. Forgive me, people. I am so sorry this is taking me a while to scroll through this. Um, okay, Suzanne Belcher, one of our dear artists, is in the audience, and she wrote to hey, all- Suzanne. Hi, Suzanne. Just loved all the presentations. The entire show is incredible. Oh, sweet. Petra's insights are always spot on and illustrate her in our connection to artwork and the artist. Thank you. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you, honey. Um, Arlene Simmons writes to the panelists, Martha, what sources can you recommend for becoming familiar with mythology? Oh, you're muted. Martha, you're muted. Um, Robert Graves, uh, Edith Hamilton, which I know is not uh, regarded in academic circles much anymore, but I think she's wonderful. I, she really, she has a, a small a small book of of the stories, and then she has uh, a book about about Greece. And she was given a, a well, she was given an award and called a, 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 the country of Greece gave her citizenship as a true Greek. <laughs> she, but I love, I love her tellings of the stories. And, um, oh, and then there, there's a children's book by Dolaire that has wonderful, very funny illustrations in it, but the, the telling is very basic of stories. And, and and those are three sources that I used. I used a lot. And then you just, if you get to know them, you, you well, it becomes your story. You're, you're, you find what's really meaningful in them and uh, it becomes your story. Can I make one brief suggestion? Yeah. There's an older book called Bullfinch's Mythology. Oh yeah, Bullfinch's. Uh, yeah, I have that too. Yeah. yeah, so it's 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 also a book you ought to consider. It's a good overview. Ah, uh, 
I I just have the little paperback. Well, it's a big paperback of Bullfinch, but yeah, they're all in there. There's there and there are lots of stories, and they just feed into one feeds into the next and the next and the next. So in the telling of it, you it's really hard because to stop because it just moves. It keeps keeps moving. The, the ultimate soap opera, isn't it? Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> It, 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 it provides a cliffhanger and then you're hooked and you got oh, to yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Arlene Simmons also has another question. That was Arlene, by the way, for Siri. Siri, can you explain more about your layering technique? Oh, um, well, it depends. I, I don't really have a systematic approach, but um, generally um, the way I go about picture is get something on the canvas at the beginning usually very thin um, paint so quite watered down sometimes toning it I've got by um, you know just putting on some watered down paint and then just kind of rubbing it in with a cloth sometimes I'll do that just to create a sort of like a dry layer but which has got a little bit of substance that you can work with um, but I don't always do that. Sometimes I just um, start sketching straight away with the sort of like the paint, like in a watercolor type consistency. And then from there, I'll just kind of, I'll, it, I'll just keep going. I mean, there'll be time in between the layers because I usually leave pictures to sort of, I work on a lot of things at the same time. So I'll kind of be away working on something else and then I'll kind of come back to it and go, ah, that's what I need to do. Um, and gradually sort of thickening up the paint is, is generally um, what I do, like palette knife, but not always. I mean, that's the kind of the general thing is going from thin to thick, but um, sometimes I just get straight in there. So it's very <laughs> intuitive, um, but generally if there is something nice going on, I'm very reluctant to, to get rid of any loose ends. So I'm very aware of all the loose ends that are kind of interesting me at any given moment and keeping them, you know, not, not obliterate, not closing in on them too much. Um, I hope that's helpful. I, I found it interesting, but metaphorically the loose ends is very interesting. I'm not a painter, so I don't know how that will translate, but I'm sure that Arlene understands it that uh, there, there's something in there. There's something in there um, narratively and metaphorically about the loose ends. I'll get back to you on that one. Um, next, we also have Suzanne Belcher, our dear Suzanne, writes, wow, thank you, Martha. Let's always remember there is hope to balance the four years of chaos we've been experiencing. Your work is astounding and deep. Oh. I'm so touched. Thank yeah. you. We, sorry, your turn. Um, Carol Stanley, also one of our dear artists, is in the audience and she writes, congratulations to you all on a unique and beautiful show. Your frank discussion of your works is truly motivating. Thank you all. Um, let sure. me if I am missing anything else, there are some lovely also just compliments. Sylvia Goulden wrote in and just again expressed her, her love and appreciation for everyone and how gorgeous the work is. Um, so let me see, we did Rick and Anna Jane, we did uh, Stan and Cheryl. Oh, this is interesting. I know little about art, but when I looked at Ceres trees, I could feel the temperature outside as if I were the bark. Nature interacting with nature. That's why I loved your artwork. Wow. Beautiful. Thanks an awful lot. That's, that's um, very touching. Thank you. Um, not Jane, we did. Theory, Martha. Martha, face dash space, amazing, exclamation point. All of them. Indeed, they are stories and wow, are you a storyteller. Your art 
the angles are so unique, showing your subjects from a high angle, almost cinematic, like Orson Welles. Please talk a little about this, your choice of angles. The angles. Uh, I wish I... <laughs> I wish I could. They seemed to just happen, and uh, and it just seemed so right. Uh, you know, I, it's it's hard to talk about the paintings because I look at them sometimes and I think, how did I do that? <laughs> uh, thank you. I'm I'm just really moved by your statements and uh, I wish I could I could say more about it. It just the angles seemed right because I suppose the stories are The part, we all see things differently and the angles come in and they're different angles that the stories go off on and some of the characters are collide or separate and I think they just came out of that. Anyway. Wonderful. That's all. Oh, well. And it's okay that you can't find the words because I think you told me when I first met you that you paint to express where the the words leave off. It's a, it's a funny thing. You know, people think I'm a very verbal person because I tell stories, but I tell other people's stories. <laughs> <laughs> and I really feel more at home in nonverbal arts, uh, which is, is interesting. Uh, somehow they they convey a feeling that that sometimes cannot be stated accurately or fully. Um, like I, I said once, it's like slipping into the skin of the character and feeling, feeling that Prometheus, such deep feeling in that character. Uh, that's that's why, why I love paint. <laughs> that. That's beautiful. Um, another uh, question or, or comment to you, Martha, which is an, an attendee wrote, uh, thank you for reminding us of hope. And uh, I, <laughs> we all second that. That was uh, a great story. And also, I think someone, one, one that we needed to hear right now and, and we definitely all need hope right now. And um, I just wanna thank all of you uh, because you give me hope all the time. But um, I also, before I leave, want to say, do you guys have any questions for each other? You've been very generous in answering the audience's questions, but if you have questions for each other, feel free. Can I make comments? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so I've been downturned before. <laughs> Please. We are all artists. We all love art. We all during the current situation. Um, have it's affected us. It's affected our our art, but we are artists, and we try. We are not going to be accepted. We are our art is not going to be accepted by everyone but that's okay the 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 real goal is to not give up it's to continue um 
our art is going to change, but we will continue. And it's not going to be accepted by all, but it's a continuation of us as artists. And that's what's really, really important, that we don't give up, that we don't lose focus. And yeah, our focus is going to change. Um, over the last year, my focus has changed, but don't give up, pursue it. Art is very important, pursue it. Thank you. Thank you, Petra. Oh, honey. Thank you so much. Thank and thank you to Jason for the photography. Oh, thank it you. is so important. Please don't give up. We will support you. We will support other artists. Hey, I'm not going to give up. Not going to let you. And I'm going to ask two more questions now. And one is your favorite question, Cheryl. I'm going to pose it to all of you beautiful artists. It's a two part question. The first one is, what is your passion? And it's kind of vaguely connected to the second question, which I'm borrowing from Jason and happy anniversary, Jason. Where does your optimism reside? Uh, my passion is a challenge of art that, um, you know, art is, art was always painting. Art was always um, sculpture, painting, whatever. My challenge is to make the fact that digital art is affected, that it's not press a button, you've created an image. That's not what it is whatsoever. Um, I want art to live on. I want art to affect people, to enhance their lives, to make them feel some semblance of calm. That's always been my, my goal. It's what it is. Beautiful. Perfectly said. Anyone? Any takers? Come on, people. <laughs> All right, I'm a taker. Taker. Uh, Cheryl, thank you. I think you're so inspiring, really. And we're one of the things that I get is that art says there's a future. We're here. This is actually a time that we emerge. It's out of the geode that we kind of show up. And art says, you know, that we have more life to do. One of the things that I recall. Petra Deer, is that uh, when I studied, I studied figure painting with Harry Carmian, who was a, a wonderful, great artist. I think Harry might still be alive. But he said to me, artists need to be around artists. Artists need to know artists. Now, I tend to be somebody who works kind of in a solitary way. But I really want to acknowledge Petra, because what you're doing in this format is creating a condition and an opportunity for the empathy that and the support that artists really do need to continue with this because this is how we're wired. 
we're wired to do this. We may do it in different ways, but what we get in a way supported and stimulated and an add a girl or an add a boy or keep going is from another artist, you know, who's kind of doing a similar thing for their life. And I, you know, I do it because, you know, I don't really want to run out into traffic. I, I do this to kind of keep my self, but I actually think at this point in time, we all need to sort of gather it up, keep going because we're saying there's a future. We want yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, I think you for throwing me into to that beautiful statement there. I, I can't take credit, but you, you guys, you guys are it. You guys are it. You created the net. You created the, the, the opportunity for this. None of this would exist without you. So um, yeah, the thanks goes to you. Um, no, Petra, <laughs> none of this would be created without you. Not true. Get, no, stop. We are an organism. It's no, stop. You are a gallery owner that has and that has embodied a respect for artists, a respect not dismissing them, not just accepting them and dismissing them. You've embodied uh, the artist. You've embodied the respect of an artist. And you've gone from there. And so you have a following. Stan and I are right up there with number one, and I'm sure Suzanne Belcher and a whole hell of a lot of others agree. You've embodied the respect for someone who wants to make things go for art. Thank you, Mom. Thank you. I want to second that. Thank you so much, Petra, for for, for oh, arranging okay. this. Call. You it's you so you can right. make tears later, but yeah. that's the truth. Well, Everyone here tonight I, I, is going to agree with that, and everyone else in other virtual receptions, whatever. Petra, you are the epitome of a superb gallery owner. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna deflect this right back into optimism, passion, who's next? <laughs> yeah, we're gonna go for this. Okay, I'll, I'll say what gets me going. Um, <laughs> um, I was thinking about it and I think the main thing, and, I, and it kind of ties in with really what everyone's doing and what you're doing Petra in bringing us together is kind of like a um, paying attention to, to things. I think that would be pretty much how I would describe my passion, paying attention and, and staying curious, you know. Um, and I see huge amounts of um, reasons to be optimistic. I mean, I see it here in the way that people are talking to each other. And I see it um, when I look at the humanity of everyday people. And I see it in the, in the natural world, which just carries on its own wonderful function. Um, so uh, that, that's my bit, but I also just wanted to say thanks to all of your, the other artists here. Um, it's been really, really interesting hearing about your process and about your work. And I look forward to seeing it in person sometime. And Martha, optimism, passion? Optimism. <laughs> I, I, find optimism it just 
by working. Uh, you asked about passion too, and I, I think it's discovery. Uh, I, I'm always surprised by things. Uh, it's making new discoveries all the time and, and, and trying to be open to them and going with them. Uh, I think there's, I think there's a lot of room for optimism. I know the last four years have been really hard for everybody. Uh, but I, I find I look at things as a whole and everything does have its opposite side. I mean, you cannot define a lot of things without defining its opposite, uh, dark and light. Uh, and that there are both both there. And so I feel that the light is always there. Sometimes we can't see it, but it's there. Um, just, just because there's dark there. Um, but sometimes we forget and sometimes it's overwhelming, but it's there. And I trust that. I really, I trust it. Thank you, Petra. Thank you. This really, this really is, uh, it's really special. It's, <laughs> and I love everyone's work. It's just so inspiring, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, you guys are great. And Siri, I did not mean to step on you, honey. I um, wanted to give you thanks back. <laughs> um, Dan the man. You have a final word for us regarding passion. What is your passion and where does your optimism reside? We go on because we must. And personal expression is the collective truth here. We don't have any choice. And uh, we're, we're, we're driven onward. And it's a fortunate thing that we are because it keeps us busy. It keeps us occupied and engaged. There's so many people out there that are suffering because they're not occupied and engaged. Yeah. And we have, to, we have to feel for them every day and realize how lucky we are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You said it, Stan the man. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Um, again, I'm not gonna get all weepy again, but you are, uh, you know, you make us what we are. You give me a reason to get up in the morning. You give me purpose. I'm so inspired by your talent. Every month, I'm amazed. Every time you email me or text me with a new work of art or a new idea, it just gives me so much joy and, and motivates me and inspires me to discover, to be truthful, to be joyful, to remember the hope in the darkness, all of those things that you mentioned. Um, Thank you. I also tonight want to thank Anthony Caldwell, whom I have forgotten consistently to thank, who has been our brave, generous, and patient webmaster, the man behind the curtain, without whom none of this could have ever happened. So thank you, Anthony Caldwell. You're not only an amazing artist, and I'm so excited to show your work very, very soon, but I also your generosity and your tutelage of baby stepping me into this new virtual world while having a nervous breakdown, resisting it. Thank you, Suzanne Belcher, um, for introducing this new format to me and schubsing me, that's a German word, it means push, pushing me into the water. Um, thank all of you. Thank you, Anthony. I um, wanna thank our audience for being here with us tonight and um, being real with us, <laughs> keeping it real. Please remember, this show is ongoing through January 31st. If you have not had a chance to come in and you own a mask and you come in two at a time, 
please come in in person, make an appointment. It's so worth it to see these things in person. Um, questions, call me, email me, go to our website. Um, to conclude, please enjoy one more time our beautiful exhibition video made by the supremely talented Jason Ruscio. Um, and as always, please be safe, stay healthy. Love you. Be good to yourselves and I love you too, very much. <laughs>